What's up, YouTube? Ready to talk a little bit of waiver wire for week two. How much fab should you spend on Elijah Mitchell? Will he be splitting with Trey Sermon and Hasty, or will he be the lead guy? Also, Mike Williams, uh, Tim Patrick, Sterling Shepard. Who's the wide receiver we like? Is anybody picking up a quarterback this week? Is anybody picking up a tight end? And we will recap last night's game. Let's rock and roll. It is waiver wire time. Our first waiver wire show of the season. What's up, everybody? Welcome. It is a big day. For Elijah Mitchell, he is rostered in 6% of CBS leagues. That is going way up after tonight, uh, waiver wire, uh, waivers run. And then again on Wednesday night, waivers run. So it's going to be a big week for Mitchell. Uh, don't drop Trey Sermon just yet. Of course, we'll talk about that. Adam Azer here with Jamie Eisenberg. Jamie, man, I would hate to have lost on that Lamar Jackson fumble. And I know that happened to somebody last night. Yeah. Imagine losing in a 2QB league on that Derek Carr touchdown, you know, where he was uh, – I don't know if you watched the Mannings uh, telecast, which was absolutely bit. amazing. Big winners last night, those uh, Mannings. That was the best part of Monday Night Football, and it was, it was a fun game. But those guys were awesome, and the guests were great. Uh, it was just really cool to hear their their insights on it. But they were basically – well, first off, the field goal, non-field goal, how it all unfolded. Uh, but, yeah, Lamar Jackson fumbling the ball um, – you know, Derek Carr with the, the hard count <laughs> that ended up oh my uh, God. knocking them backwards. Then the interception, it was just a weird, weird ending. But um, obviously, Lamar Jackson was was the one that was the most started of the guys who had the flaws at the end of the game. Yeah, look at Schrager. Oh, no, it happened. He lost because of the fumble. <laughs> wow, my dad texted me, congrats. He's like, great, you won. I didn't oh, win yet. Man. He loses 154.3 to 153.5. Is there any uh any of your players um close in terms of you know pushing a number up or down potentially? Stack I know it's decimals, but still. It's decimal, so I'm gonna need 10 yards from somebody. But no, no one had a fumble outside of Lamar. Uh all right. Well, I mean, that was a wild game. It was a lot of fun and a great Monday night game. And I thought the I thought the Raiders were going to get crushed, but that was before two pretty big injuries for the Ravens and uh, their offense. It, you know, it just looked a little bit different last night. But obviously, we'll talk about that. And Latavius Murray might be available for you. He's available in some leagues as well. All right, Jamie. Who are the top three waiver wire priorities at any position this week? I would say, you know, and this is the, the numbers we typically talk about, you know, is 65% of leagues on CBS or less. Um, but so that factors in 10 team leagues, you know, so keep that in mind. So for me, it would be Elijah Mitchell one, uh, Naheem Hines, who was at the number at 65% would be two. And Mike Williams would be three at 63%. If you want to take away the two heavily rostered guys of, uh, Hines and Williams, I would say two would then be Sterling Shepard and three would probably be, uh, again, I'll remove Tony Jones at 57%. I'll say Kenneth Gainwell as the third guy. Yeah, I think the enthusiasm is going to going to drop after Mitchell and and Williams and Hines. Just being Shepard too. Shepard look good. Yeah, Shepard's really interesting. Because he had six catches basically in every game he played with Daniel Jones last year, except for two. One of them he left with an injury. And the other one, I think you remember, Jamie, the Arizona game where everybody's like, why is Daniel Jones playing? He shouldn't be playing. Right. So he's a catch machine with, with Jones, but usually not a lot of yards. But he had over 100 and a touchdown uh, last week. He's only 28% rostered. Uh, but, you know, one thing about Shepard, I didn't realize that this is 300, uh, not 300 yard games in a row, three in a row with a touchdown dating back to last year, week 16 and 17, 77 yards in a touchdown, 112 yards in a touchdown, 113 yards in a touchdown in week one. That's pretty interesting. You know, he might just lead the team in receiving this year. So um, he's got a contract to play for his job in the future in jeopardy after drafting Kadarius Tony. Um, Kenny Galladay has got a hard time staying healthy. Evan Ingram's out right now. So, yeah, I think he's in a good spot. You like him this week against Washington, though? I mean, if people are, are trying to make a, a claim that they're going to be able to use this week, Thursday night game at Washington, is that going to be a start for Shepard? Number three receiver in PPR. He's clearly better in PPR than non-PPR until he proves otherwise of a more consistent, you know, longer span, you know, not just going back to last year with a touchdown. So uh, absolutely should be rostered, though, uh, 100%. You know, don't look just week two. You know, that's something I think that we make the mistake of with our waiver claims. You're not just looking one week. You're looking long-term, which is why – uh, when we get to the running backs, for example, you know, people might be saying, well, why haven't we talked to Mark Ingram yet? Uh, 26 carries, 85 yards and, or 80 plus yards and, and a touchdown. I just think that was his best game, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, you want to look long-term. If I need a running back this week, I'm probably picking up Ingram over Gainwell and Tony Jones. When you see my list, 
Um, but I don't want to trust Mark Ingram if I don't have to. I'm, I'm going to get to Elijah Mitchell in just a second. Let me just follow up on on uh, Mark Ingram. because He did have all those carries, and we don't think they're going to win a lot of games. They're not going to play Jacksonville every week. But uh, what kind of comparison could we make here with him? You know, I feel like he could get 15-ish carries and – you know, six, you know, 60 ish yards and hope he scores. But that's the thing though. You're hoping he scores, you know, 26 carries for 80 some on yards. Obviously the average is not good. So he's going to have to grind his way to production. So 15 carries is going to end up maybe being 60 yards at best. You know, if you just look at the way that he ran in the preseason as well, and the way this offense is going to be, then you factor in that what happens if Philip Lindsay gets a, a good series or two, or if David Johnson gets a you know series or two, and as we saw, all three running backs scored touchdowns. Uh, the lack of work in the passing in the passing game is is alarming as well. So uh, I just think Mark Ingram, you know, I liked him as a sleeper. I had him as a sleeper and start sitting in the sleepers column. But again, I think this was probably his best game until he shows me something against a more competitive team. They do get the Jaguars in Week 15. If he's still the lead running back for the Texans, you could start him then for sure. Okay, now let's talk about Elijah Mitchell. So he's got the Eagles this week. And it appears that's going to be a tough matchup. But for 49ers running back, you know, that probably just does not really matter. Um, so, sorry, let me just get my notes on, on what they did last year. Uh, what are your expectations in terms of workload, in terms of, you know, well, let's start with workload. But but basically, how much fab should we spend on Elijah Mitchell? That's, I think that's the biggest question because he's going to be the first player added off waivers. He should be the first player out of waivers. You know, unless you're just desperate at wide receiver and Mike Williams is there and you want to make that your you know your guy, um, or there's somebody else. You know, we'll, we'll we'll talk about some of the players that are a little bit more rostered. So every league is different. We know that, but I think he's going to be the most added player off waivers. The question becomes is how much fab do you spend? Because, you know, most leagues, $100 budget or $1,000 budget, you know, but it's in that in that number, you know, it's always the percentage. Um, a lot of uh, sites, you know, us included, we do early waiver columns, you know, so you're doing these right after the game on site. Chris Towers does a great job with ours, and, and that was his the player he listed. Um, but you don't have the full scope of information. I don't even know if I have the full scope of information for the story that's going to be up on our site, you know, by the time it's usually up by about noon Eastern on Tuesday. Um, I think what we're going to end up seeing is to answer your workload question. Can't imagine Trey Sermon is not active now with, without Raheem Mostert healthy. So was it the injuries for Sermon? He had the finger problem, a little bit of an ankle problem in the preseason. And that's why he was, you know, pushed down the depth start a little bit. Is it going to be hasty getting more work? Um, he didn't have a lot to do in the game. Oh, one carry. Right. But it was an important one. Right. Touchdown. Yeah. Uh, so I think Mitchell's the guy for now, but there's two things at play here. One, Moser is going to come back in eight weeks. So it's not a season ending thing. And then don't forget about Jeff Wilson. If you have IR spots, we said this, you know, you were, you were praising me for doing this. Um, well, not cursing you, but also praising you. Right. I, I know what you meant. Um, you're being a jerk <laughs> as usual. Um, but I think if you have IR spots and Jeff Wilson's still sitting there, you should pick him up because it's now five weeks until he's eligible to return because he missed the first week. So he's on the pup list. Uh, and, and Shanahan referenced, you know, when he comes back, he'll provide some relief for this team. So, you know, you have not necessarily a short window for Elijah Mitchell, but not a big window. Uh, but I think for me, Fab, I, I, the way I explained it in, in the waiver wire column is I'm going to tell people to, you know, spend around 20%. Uh, I think, though, in some running back desperate leagues, it's probably going to be north of 40% because – Guys just don't become available all the time, especially if they're going to give you maybe five weeks of becoming the starter. But I would do that with caution. You know, so if you don't need Elijah Mitchell, then somebody else go spend for him. Uh, the positive is obviously this 49ers run offense, as you alluded to. They typically give north of 20 carries to their running back group on a weekly basis. Last year, it was almost 25 carries to their running backs. We saw it was 22 carries in week one against the Eagles. Um, it might have been more if most of it was healthy. So... Um, that's the positive. They also don't throw to the running backs very much, so that's going to be a negative. They score a lot of touchdowns. They've averaged in the last two years more than one rushing touchdown per game by running backs, not just total rushing touchdowns, but running backs. So we like that. You know, Based on week one, he could have a pretty tough schedule. It, you wouldn't think so. At Philadelphia, I mean, I, I, I did think Philadelphia was going to have a great run defense, and they, and, were, and they did. Games. Um, Green Bay at the end of last year was really, really good against the run. They did, a, they did okay. I mean, they, they sucked all around, but they did okay. But Seattle did pretty well against 
the Colts and Arizona was great against their game. I, you know, people care about this. I don't really care about this right now, right? You just got to pick up Elijah Mitchell, but I know a lot of people like to break down the matchups. And then you've got a buy, and then Jeff Wilson, I think, could be back after the buy, right? Because it's not six games, it's six weeks. Yeah. So, well, that would be, yeah, that would be six And weeks. if Mostert beats the timetable, too. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Mostert is just so fragile. It's so sad. Um, but yeah, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. How much fab would you spend on Mitchell? I I think I'd spend about 30%. Okay. I, I think I would, but but I'm nervous about it. Uh, if, if I ha- if I had three running backs that I really like, then I probably would skip it because look, it's week one. We're gonna unfortunately we're gonna get more and more running back injuries, and there might be situations that are more clear than 49ers backfield, which is is not usually all that clear. And you might want to spend 80 percent of your fab on someone at that point, you know. So I don't want to waste a ton of fab. I don't want to spend. I'm not gonna say waste. So let me give you let me give you an example of a, of a league that I'm. I'm dealing with. So it's a league I share with my brother-in-law and we lost Gus Edwards. Our third running back going into the season was Javante Williams behind Ezekiel Elliott. Now we managed to win because we have Waller. We have good receivers, uh, Kyler Murray, you know, it just happened to work out for us that with Zeke's stinking and we started Javante Williams, but we already spent, uh, out of a hundred dollar budget, $16 to get Tony Jones. Cause I wanted to make sure we had him. He was, a bit, somebody dropped him to pick up Le'Veon Bell. Imagine that. And then, uh, <laughs> Latavius Murray was on, on the waiver wire. So this was before the Le'Veon Bell edition was before Murray signed with the with the Ravens. Yeah. And Murray was available. So I spent another $16 on on Murray. What I like to do, and, and this is something I guess for people listening to our waiver wire show for the first time, I'll always go usually a dollar over the five. So if it's if if most people think they're gonna go 15, I'll go I always go 16, I'll always go 11, 21, those type of things. You know, it's just a little trick that I think works from time to time. Anyway, it's a hundred dollar budget. Hundred dollar budget. So yeah. now I'm so I'm you, I'm not spending. So that that's what I'm saying. Like I'm thirty-two dollars down already. Yeah. On those two guys. So now my backfield, our backfield, is Zeke, Javante, those two guys, and uh, we have Giovanni Bernard. I also have Justin Jackson who I'm going to cut. But um, I don't want to spend 30% of the, my remaining budget on Elijah Mitchell because I know what's coming. Well, and, but, I stole, and I stole a win. You know what I mean? Well, here's the thing. You know what's coming, but you might have the lead running back. You know, Let's play the optimistic side here on Elijah Mitchell. So last year, where he most got hurt in week two, week three, if you just look at the box score, you see 14 carries for McKinnon, you see 12 for Jeff Wilson. But what you don't see is that McKinnon left that game with an injury, and seven of Wilson's 12 carries came in the fourth quarter after the injury. They really did just let Jarek McKinnon be the guy. The following week, McKinnon had 14 carries and seven catches, and Jeff Wilson had four touches in the game. So you had that. You Kevin Cohn was hurt at that point, right? I yes, I'm pretty sure he was. Um, you had uh, the then the end of the season was was what you don't want. That was Mostert and Wilson basically splitting close to 50 50. But Wilson was Mostert, awesome. Mostert started the season. Well, Wilson was awesome when Mostert got hurt at the last two games of the year. Mostert or Wilson had like 20 carries. He had 22 carries. He was the playoff carries. hero for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. But when Mostert was healthy, he wasn't. But but what I'm saying. Is, Okay, so so beginning of the year last year, Mostert looks like a lead back. He's getting that kind of work when he's healthy. He's, you know, not saying he's going to get 20 carries, but he was definitely going to get more than 15 um, or around there at least. Uh, then he gets hurt, and they kind of use Jarek McKinnon in that way. And they had a middle of the season where a lot of guys were hurt, and, and Wilson had some moments. Hasty had a game. Then the last two games of the year, Mostert gets hurt again, and you get 20-plus carries in two straight games from Jeff Wilson. So... I wouldn't just eliminate the possibility that Elijah Mitchell, who had, what did he have last week? He had 19 19 carries compared to one for Hasty and an inactive Trey Sermon. I wouldn't eliminate the possibility that he's 15 plus carries. And if he is, he's probably worth 50% of your, of your fab. If you really need a run. But but again, though, it's what is Trey Sermon's role going to be? But that's that's the wild part reason, you know, I mean, Right. But okay. So let, let's, let's take the negative side, the, the pessimistic side of this, because obviously I love Mostert for week one. He was the start of the week. Um, I hope I'm not a mush again. Uh, in, in, I, I heard Prisco, by the way, on, on fantasy football today, the video show goes, sorry for Mostert. When you said it, you're like, tough, some tough break for Mostert. That was um, so with, uh, with Sermon, oh, I'm sorry, let's take the, the pessimistic side. What would Mitchell's role have been with Mostert healthy? Like, would it have been, you know, 12 carries for Mostert and 10 carries for Mitchell? You know, is that is that the split? No, I, I don't think so. I think it would have been 20 carries for Mostert and, like, five for Mitchell. I, what do you think? I, I think that they were 
going to use. I think you were going to nail it with the start of the week. I think that Moser would have had a big game, yeah. but I think it would have been either A, they would have pulled him when they had the big lead. Obviously, Detroit came back late in the game. Yeah. But I also think that they know Mostert is not the most durable running back. So I don't think it would have been 19 carries for Mostert. I think it probably would have been 15. You know, I think they probably wouldn't have capped it at 15. So I wonder if Mitchell's going to be, you know, 15. And then maybe Sermon gets six to eight. And what does Sermon do in those six to eight? So that's the only reason I'm a little bit hesitant. And again, it's potentially week six uh, or week seven, whenever the buy is. I forgot what you said. Um, yeah. That that Wilson's back and then I'm sorry, week six. And then we have, uh, and then we have most are coming back. So he can help you in these next few weeks. There's without saying, it goes without saying that Mitchell can help you in the next few weeks, but I think you just have to be a little bit cautious with going overboard. So I think 30% is a good number. Like I said, I said 20, I wouldn't be surprised. If it was 40. I don't think you want to go necessarily too crazy. And like I saw people when I, when I tweeted this, uh, Oh, it's the Eliza Mitchell show, whatever I said, you know, the rush to Elijah Mitchell is on. And people were saying, oh, 100% of my budget's going to, you know, no, don't do that. No, don't do don't that. Do that. Uh, yeah. So would, would you drop Trey Sermon for Mitchell? No, no way. Not now. Not for Mitchell. You'd rather have Sermon? Oh, if that's my only move, I guess you have to. Yeah. But I, I would imagine that's a 10 team league or something like that. Would you drop Javante Williams for Elijah Mitchell? Man, you no. probably don't have to. I mean, let's be real. You have worse. Players. No, I, I, I'll tell you, I'm in a 12 team league where you start one running back. Uh -huh. It's a it's a weird league. You start one running back. I'm sorry, it's not a 12. It's a 10 team league. One running back, two receivers, and a flex. And I had Sermon on my team. Um, and like this was after the draft. Like Tyson Williams didn't get drafted. Like we only had we have very small benches. So like I'm regretting now not dropping Sermon for for Wilson, Williams. You know he was probably the best running back available. But I'll drop Sermon in that league. All right. So would you drop Giovanni Bernard for Elijah Mitchell in a non PPR league? 100. In a PPR league, I think you have to as well. All right. All right, let's get so and then there's Naeem Hines is interesting as well. He had a big week one last year and then he really disappointed. Well, 15 total touches with nine carries. That was impressive. Yeah. Six catches and, and Marlon Mack not playing. Yeah. And that, that was why he had a big week one last year too. Mack got Mack got hurt and then Hines went off. Um, but he did have eight games last year with at least four catches. So in PPR, you can feel kind of safe about that. The only problem is like when I when I write these things. I would imagine the 65% where he's rostered, that's all 12 teams PPR. League. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's probably not available when you're in the leagues that you want him in. Uh, all right, so more on that, uh, more on the guys to pick up pretty soon. You, If you want to, if you have more questions tonight, right before you make your waiver claims, 8 p.m. Eastern, join us on YouTube, youtube.com slash fantasy football today. Uh, we have a live stream every Tuesday night. So that's 8 p.m. on Tuesday nights, 2 p.m. Eastern on Thursday afternoons. Sunday, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. You can find all of this at youtube.com slash fantasy football today. And then approximately 8.15 p.m. on Sunday night, we do our, our podcast then and we live stream it. So youtube.com slash fantasy football today. And last night or Sunday night was the first time we had done that. And it was actually pretty helpful because we got some real-time reaction from the people who were watching. You know, would rather have this guy or this guy and that kind of stuff. So that was that was a cool element there. Um, how much fab would you spend on Mike Williams? You know, you could definitely make the case that he should be the number one player added because, you know, he has more season long potential than Mitchell and he is 63% rostered. So he won't be the most added, but he might be 90% rostered by tomorrow. Uh, and he gets Dallas this week. So, uh, you know, you talked about him. You said he, he could be this year's Devonte Parker, this year's Corey Davis off to a good start there. 12 targets, second, most of his career, career high in catches with eight. Um, yeah, how much would you spend on Mike Williams? So you remember what we said a lot during August, that some of these early August injuries are going to drive down the price of a lot of these players that we still had some hope for. And, the, you know, two of the few that we kept referencing, you know, I don't want to you know discard the fact that we said Curtis Samuel was part of this, and obviously he's still injured. But Mike Williams, Marquise Brown were two of the names that kept coming up because they missed almost, you know, all of training camp and, and the preseason. Um, this was what you were hoping to see. You know, big part of Joe Lombardi's offense, big part of Justin Herbert, uh, you know, it wasn't Josh Palmer and the other guys being compilers. And then it was, you know, Williams being lumped into that group aside from Austin Eckler and Mike Williams. So this was great to see. And it was a tough matchup. And like you said, you know, uh, targets were, you know, among his career best receptions among his career best. Um, best. Heath made brought up the point on Monday's uh, fantasy football today. So on CBS sports HQ, where he does his believe it or not segment. So it's also in his column. That Mike Williams is a top 25 receiver rest of way. I always say west of way, rest of way. 
Um, why, did he, why did he go top 25, by the way? Like, we go in multiples of 12 here. here. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just, you know, that's always where, where fantasy and, like, reality also split. Like, most people go in multiples of 25. I think um, he's, you know, I think I think Mike Williams will be in the also receiving votes category. I don't think. <laughs> right. <That's a> good <laughs> call. Um, so anyway, so he likes him as a borderline starter. Uh, Chris Towers, who was on the show, he pushed back with with two, I think, good points. One, the injury concern that you're always going to have with Mike Williams because he has a hard time staying healthy. And then Austin Eckler was not involved in the passing game. You know, the hamstring injury, who knows what they what they were doing. You know, that's not going to be the case moving forward to, to the level that we typically expect from Austin Eckler. So I think those two things you have to factor in. So I think he's in the number three receiver conversation. It's where I had him ranked before the injuries. You know, he was like in that 35 to 40 range. I kept moving him up and down a few spots. Um, so I'm excited about him. You know, I, I think there's a lot to like. And, you know, we've seen that guy, Parker Davis, you know, left for the scrap heap by his own team because they didn't want to pick up the fifth year option and go out and get your, you know, your, your money deal. Parker got it from the Dolphins. Davis now got it from the Jets. And, you know, we'll see what happens with Williams. But this is a guy that's had, you know, a thousand yard season. He's had 10 touchdowns a season. Uh, he's averaged over 20 yards per catch one time in his career. So there's a lot to like about what his upside could be. And we didn't really see it fully last season with, uh, with Justin Herbert. Maybe we're going to see it this year uh, in year two for Herbert. I'm going to read a quick email here. It's from Brent. And he says, uh, dear Eli uh, Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy. I just have no idea who those are. You have no idea what that is? That's Hamilton. Oh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't really know much about Hamilton. I, I started reading the book mm. and then I was like, this is going to take. I think you would like the music. I probably I, I might. Yeah. Uh, all right. I've joined an 18 team guillotine league. Now I'm reading this because some people are in guillotine leagues. I am one too. You're in one. I'm, I'm not. And that's a big regret of mine. I wish I. Yeah, I, we should do an office one. Uh, the low score is eliminated. Yeah, so how, a guillotine league, the lowest score every week is out, and all of his or her players are available in fab. Uh, so the, the lowest scoring team had Christian McCaffrey. Ooh. How much, what percentage of your budget would you bid on McCaffrey? I don't know how to play this game. I've never done it before. So it's week two. You've got, there's going to be great players on waivers every week, I assume, because of one team yes. is being eliminated. But McCaffrey is McCaffrey here. So how much would you spend on McCaffrey? So in, in mine, um, I think the best player, I didn't look at the receivers, but I need, I have a need at running back. So the best player is Ezekiel Elliott. No surprise. You know, he had a bad week one. Uh, last year after week one, I had a tight end issue and I spent, I think, six or 700 out of a thousand on Darren Waller. Now, clearly that worked out. I made it until I think I was in like the final five or six. Uh, I got close to the end, but not in the final four. Um, <laughs> but every week you're watching these guys that you can't pick up because yeah. there's going to be two to five, three to five superstars every week that become available because what happens is like every team gets better and better and then they get eliminated because they're a low score. So it just floods your, you know, your waiver wire. Um, and what ends up happening is once the teams that spend their money, you know, so like, let's say I had $10 left and the other guy had 50, you know, he could pick up five, you know, four or five players that I can't, um, without maxing out however the, the math works out. Um, <laughs> so cool. Uh, so in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get Zeke because my, I have really two running backs. I have Derek Henry and Damien Harris, but my receivers are loaded and I have decent quarterback. And luckily I have Gronk who had a good week one. Um, but I'm going to try and play a little bit more conservative because remember, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, it, it's a funny commercial to me, at least it's a, it's one of the Red Bull commercials. And I think it's like two gazelles maybe talking to each other and a lion comes out of the, the, the bush, whatever the, the, the forest and says, uh, and the one gazelle says to the other, I'm going to drink a Red Bull, whatever. Uh, and, and the gazelle says, that's going to help you out, outrun a lion. And he says, no, but it'll help me outrun you. <laughs> and. <laughs> and, and basically, like, I don't have to win the league now. I just have to not finish last. Not lose. Right. So do I want to save my money and push right, it so, forward? All right. So this is a thousand dollar budget for you. So how much are you going to spend on Zeke? And how I'll, much put, I'll put in a four hundred dollar bid on Zeke. Okay, now, what if it were McCaffrey? <laughs> Probably eight hundred. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. He's McCaffrey, man. Like, he didn't even score last week and he scored like 20. 24 PPR, whatever it was. I mean, amazing. All right. Uh, it's not to say I don't like, because obviously, you know, I, I, we had the conversation last week where Dave and I are yelling at each other, um, where I like Zeke uh, still plenty, but it's more about reserving the, the funds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. 
And it's more, and it's also about that McCaffrey's just so much better than basically everybody. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Let me talk to you about Lightstream here, okay? Have you ever looked at your credit card statement and been shocked by the interest rate? And did you know that you could actually roll all your credit card debt into one monthly payment at a lower fixed interest rate? Well, you can lower your rate and save with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. Rates start at 5.93% APR with auto pay and excellent credit. And the rate is fixed, so it's never going to go up over the life of the loan. You can get a loan. From $5,000 to $100,000 with absolutely no fees. And you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. This is a great service from Lightstream. They believe that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience, and that's exactly what they deliver. So our listeners, you already get, I mean, you're already getting a great rate. If you have good credit, you're getting a great rate from Lightstream. But you can get an even bigger discount, a special interest rate discount to save even more. The only way to get this is to go to Lightstream. Excuse me, lightstream.com slash FFT. That is L I G H T S T R E A M dot com slash FFT. Subject to credit approval, rates range from 5.93% APR to 19.99% APR and include a 0.5% auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash FFT for more information. Got a lot of news and notes. Ryan Fitzpatrick looking like six to eight weeks with the hip injury. Thursday night game against the Giants. Taylor Heineke, I talked about it on yesterday's show. If you listen to that one, uh, it really he's done an admirable job uh, in, in his limited appearances with the Washington. He runs. He does run, yeah. Uh, Raheem Mostert, looking about eight weeks, chip cartilage in his knee. Jerry Judy, I guess we can call this good news. About Well, maybe. Four to six weeks looks like the minimum for Judy. Yeah, I think I saw six to eight as well. Uh, Vic Fangio said the wide receiver snaps would be divided up between three players instead of four, and those three are Sutton, Tim Patrick, and K.J. Hamler. Patrick's the one I think you want to look at. Yeah. Uh, I know Dave is very high on him, Um, on the waiver wire anyway. The next two games are Jacksonville and the Jets. Antonio Gibson was limited in, you know, quote-unquote practice. They got the Thursday game, so you get the Monday practice report, shoulder injury. He did well. I saw when he walked off in, in the game, he pointed at his shoulder. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. But he came back and finished the game. So I'm sure it's just something to keep an eye on. Zach Ertz will keep an eye on his hamstring. He should be able to play. He came back in the game, but he has the hamstring. Jamison Crowder could play this week against New England. Tyrell Williams is in the concussion protocol. There goes that receiving core. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Quintez Cephas, he, he didn't make your waiver wire call, JB, did he? Uh, no, he did not. But I was looking at, you know, just doing rankings for, for this week. It's like, nah, none of these guys are going to crack the top 48 by by far, and probably not, you know, many of them in the top 150. See if this would be the closest. Though. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think he he led the receivers at least in targets, but that doesn't mean he will this week. Uh, I think he knows catching the ball there. Kudos to Heath with his uh, running back call. Yeah, but that's such an imp- – no, you're right, absolutely. Uh, but – Looking at that game, and I got—I know not everybody listens to the Monday show because it comes out like three o'clock Eastern, and it's—it's it's just different. But you know, I—I I didn't realize it at the time, but they—they they pulled all their starters. Yeah, they pulled a lot of their starters on defense, San Francisco, and that's when Jared Goff and the rest of the offense went went nuts. They did it again. It was like a preseason game. They did it against a lot of backups. Keep that in mind. Now Swift had the screen pass for a touchdown. But look at Jared Goff's first half numbers. It was like 15 of 20 for around 70 yards. Uh, anyway, Zach Martin's back for the Cowboys, but Randy Gregory, one of their pass rushers, he's on the reserve COVID list, and also Lyle Collins starting right tackle. He's out for five games. Zach Martin might actually play right tackle for them. Michael Gallup is out three to five weeks with a calf strain. You're going to see Cedric Wilson as the number three wide receiver without Gallup, and obviously a big boost for, for the top two receivers there. Um, I'll skip some of these injuries here, but the Jets had a really bad week. They obviously lost, but also left tackle Mikai Becton out four to six weeks. Lamarcus Joyner starting safety. He's out for the season, and they're going to be missing a rookie, but a starting linebacker, Jamie and Sherwood, for two weeks. The Saints had a bad week. Center Eric McCoy, who's a, a star, left with a leg injury. I don't know his status. Marshawn Lattimore and Marcus Davenport, two of their best defensive players, they're going to be out, but it doesn't seem like long injuries for them. But Carolina this week, Carolina's going to have an easier matchup. Lattimore hurt his thumb signing that big contract extension. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Left tackle Trent Brown has a calf injury for the Patriots. They're at the Jets this week. Here's what ESPN, they did like a recap of the, just a quick recap of the Steelers game. And uh, their reporter wrote, the offensive line, 
which included two rookies making their NFL debuts, was abysmal, especially in the first half. That can't make you feel too good. And uh, that'll be it. All right. Also, Let's- part of that was you, you ref- I think you're referencing Mike Reese's story. Um, he said he wrote that Damien Harris could see a reduced workload from the fumble. So I saw the headline on Roto World and then I read the story. And it was, he's great. I mean, he's one of the best, you know, he's great following the Patriots. It was more speculative than anything. Oh, totally, totally. It's not confirming anything. And I, my thought was like, and he made a great point. I mean, you've seen guys fumble for the Patriots and, and lose some work, but it was only one fumble so far. And Stevenson also fumbled, and they don't have Tom Brady anymore. So I don't really know that you could just take your best running back off the field and, you know, and leave it in Mac Jones. Yeah, it, it definitely helped him that Stevenson fumbled. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's do top three at each position because we will get deeper into the waiver wire later. But for the names you need to know, today I knew today was going to be a lot of Elijah Mitchell talk, but um, top three at each position, Jamie, to pick up off waivers, quarterback. So quarterback is, is an interesting position because there's not, like, I think, one standout star. Uh, the one guy that I'll, I'll look at first is Derek Carr, um, not just because of what he did last night, but he had a strong finish last season. If you take out the game that he you know got hurt last year, I think it was week 14 or 15, um, against the Chargers, I think it was, where Marcus Mariota came in and finished the game. Um, it would be now five straight games of 24 or more fantasy points. And so I don't think they're going to have the greatest run game. I don't think last night's an indication of that because obviously the Rams are really good against the run, but I don't know if they're going to be you know, a team that's going to lean on the, on the ground. And uh, Clark, I think, could you know work his way into the streaming conversation, especially if he has another good game against Pittsburgh. So he would be the first one. Terod Taylor would be the second one. And I know that probably sounds strange because, again, they just beat up the Jaguars. But you know he's going to run a little bit. Had four carries for 40 yards in that game. And that's, I think, going to be a little bit of a difference maker for him compared to some of these other guys. So another quarterback that I want to keep an eye on, seeing how he does against Cleveland. And then this is more matchup-based, but Teddy Bridgewater gets the Jaguars this week. No, Knowing he's down, Jerry Judy still. But I think if you are stuck at, for whatever reason, um, in a 14-team league, 16-team league, and Teddy's available, I think he's got a chance to have a decent game again after having, a, I think it was like 22 points, 23 points against the Giants in week one. 23 points and a six-point for passing touchdown league and should have had more of that 50-yard touchdown pass dropped and played really well. Good start for him. Jackson, not only does he have Jacksonville this week, he has the Jets next week. Uh, if Jameis Winston is available, would you prioritize him? First, by far. Okay. Um, all right. And then top three running backs, Elijah Mitchell, Naheem Hines, and give me a third. I put Tony Jones third, you know, um, it's for two reasons. One, I think he's going to play, you know, usually we get somewhere around eight to 10 touches for Latavius Murray in the past. Uh, we had 12 touches for Jones. Now clearly they were blown out the Packers. So take that into consideration, but 11 carries for 50 yards. Uh, the second part of it is clearly the big reason why you'd be looking at him is should something happen to Alvin Kamara? He's a potential league winner. All right. Top three wide receivers after Mike Williams, who do you got? Uh, Sterling Shepard would be two. And then I put Cole Beasley three. But uh, again, if those guys are rostered in too many leagues, and and again, we're looking at Williams at 63% and Beasley at 60%. So if you want to go with the guys that are under 30%, uh, the first guy for me would be Shepard. The second guy for me would be Tim Patrick. And then the third guy, I put Jalen Rager. So he would actually be fifth. But um, clearly he was involved in week one. And, you know, this is a former first round pick. Uh, for a team that needs some help at the receiver position still, even with the tight ends and Devontae Smith. Uh, if Rager's going to get six targets on a weekly basis, I think he has a chance to be a decent streamer or a potential guy that you can you know, maybe lean on in the pinch. I can't really see myself being super active on waivers unless, you know, like a, like a Marquise Brown or something slipped through the cracks. Um, but I will say that Sammy Watkins, by the way, did lead the team in receiving and targets. He had 96 yards on eight targets. Brown had the touchdown. But I, I mean, it's just not. A, I don't think it's a great week, and we, we haven't even gotten to the tight ends. But I don't, I don't think they're anything special. The, the, the receiver position, you know, I think the guys at the top have some long term appeal. You know, Patrick, for as long as as Judy's out, we saw him do a great job last year with Sutton out. Um, Beasley and Williams, you know what you're getting. Shepard, I think you kind of know what you're getting at this point. You know, we were we were talking about him in the preseason. I'm surprised that his roster percentage is as low as it is. Um, it's the it's the guys after that, you know, from Rager down, because like I have Nelson Aguilar there. He scored. He had more targets than I anticipated. Christian Kirk had the two touchdown game, you know, but there's still a crowd of receiving core there. Zach Pascal, you mentioned Sammy Watkins. Uh, you bullied me into Devontae Parker. 
Um, <laughs> Gabriel Davis scored. We know he has some upside. Uh, Hunter yeah. Renfro, six catches. You know, so there's there's a lot of guys. So I wouldn't go crazy with your your waiver. Yeah. Only your fat budget, but your waiver well, did. It's gonna be like this every week at wide receiver. Right, half these guys that I'm gonna mention in in the story uh, are gonna get cut next week. And let me just be clear. I mean, if if Mike Williams or Elijah Elijah Mitchell will be available, if Mike Williams is available, I'm definitely gonna be interested. I know I have a lot of like I have a lot of like Le'Veon Bell. I have Gabriel Davis in a couple leagues. I just had an empty roster, but let's take a chance here. I'll probably drop him. Um, so I know I will be active, but I I think you know for the most part the guys I started last week are probably gonna be in my lineups for you know especially at quarterback and. And tight end, I don't, I'm not sure I saw anyone really emerge. But let, you tell me, tight end, is there anyone that we need to be adding? So the two that I have at the top, uh, one is more of a, hey, let's see what happens in Juwan Johnson because he's, uh, you know, the two touchdowns, he only played 12 offensive snaps. But, you know, uh, you know, I, I lean on Pete Prisco a lot for the, the, the guys that he speaks to and knows. And he knows Sean Payton. And he was with Sean Payton. And Sean told him that he likes this, this guy a lot. Now, he only had three targets. Two of them were in the end zone. Um, but Adam Trout had six. So, you know, just take that into account that he's not the primary tight end and he's more of a hybrid uh, for a team that, you know, didn't throw the ball a lot, but still got five touchdowns from, from their quarterback. So we'll see what happens with him moving forward. The other one who impressed me, though, was Cole Komet. Um, you know, if you watch that game, you saw how involved he was. And he had uh, seven targets, five catches, 42 yards. Nobody on the team had more than 45 yards receiving. That's a great defense that they faced. The Bengals don't have that same level of defense. So if Komet can continue to get seven targets, um, I might be making a mistake by not putting Komet first, and I explain that in, in the story. But uh, Johnson, just because if he can continue to be a red zone threat, you know Jameis likes tight ends. So Komet is second for me. And then third was Gerald Everett. I don't like the fact that Will Disley had more targets, but now they're down two receivers in Eskridge and, and Penny Hart suffering concussions. And so one of those two guys I think will step up. I'm hoping it's Everett. He did score the touchdown. Um, so he's the third tight end. But once you get past those three guys, it's a lot of like, okay, maybe this, maybe that, Farrell Brown, James O'Shaughnessy, you know, those type of guys. Well, I, I'm just not convinced. And I, again, I know I brought this up on yesterday's show with Chris, but I'm not convinced that Troutman shouldn't be the top waiver wire option. He played about 80% of the snaps, and you mentioned already the snap count for Jawan Johnson. And he led the team in targets. He had six targets and Winston only threw 20 passes. So that's obviously a big share. I feel fairly confident that there's going to be tight end production for the Saints. Uh, I don't know who it is. It could because if obviously if the snaps counts stay the same and the targets stay the same, then it should be Troutman. But Jawan Johnson, this is really his first chance to 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 show himself, and he scored two touchdowns. So maybe that means a bigger role is coming. But I I mean. Should should it not be Troutman? Obviously, it, it very well could. Like I said, I, I I might be making a mistake, so you know you put me on record for that. Um, and and I apologize if people chase Johnson and he doesn't deliver. But I I I like to rely on people that I trust, and you know there's probably nobody more in this business that I trust more than Pete. And you know he's typically steered me in the right direction. So, uh, unfortunately, Sean Payton has steered me in the wrong direction with tight ends time and time again. So really? take that into account. But yeah, it, it could be Troutman. I, I just think this is. It's also not going to be very, very many instances, I think, where their true number one receiver, whether that's Michael Thomas or Marcus Callaway, is as much of a non-factor. Well, let's face it. It could be. I, we don't know. It, not for Tom. When Thomas comes back, no. But can't eliminate. I like Marcus, Marcus Callaway. I can't eliminate the fact that he might he might just not be that good, you know? Uh, so well, it, like they could really rely on the tight ends, I guess. And they're both widely available, Juwan Johnson. And Adam Troutman, top DSTs to pick up. This is, this is where I might be active. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying this for a while. The Browns, uh, I thought their roster percentage actually be a little bit higher. Clearly not facing the Chiefs, but, you know, I was surprised at 47%. Uh, I put the Packers next at 34%. I think they're going to destroy the Lions after getting embarrassed by the Saints back home Monday night. Um, so Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, I think are going to be huge, especially with Jeff Okuda out for the rest of the season after ru rupturing his Achilles. So that secondary got worse as well. And then I put the Giants third. Um, I don't think their defensive performance was truly indicative of that side of the ball. You know, they gave up the big run at the end to Melvin Gordon. Uh, but now you got Taylor Heineke. You know, like you said, he, he's shown that he can make some plays, but it's still short week. Um, Giants, not necessarily in desperation mode yet, but, you know, it's it's going to get close to that pretty soon, especially how, uh, you know, people in media, for example, are viewing Dave Gettleman's job and Joe Judge's job potentially. So uh, I think the defense comes out and plays well against Washington. All right, uh, IDP, 
I'm just going to give one name that I, I gave on Sunday morning, and I wish I had actually had the guts to go go get him, was Nick Vigil. But I would say you've got an opportunity, either Anthony Barr, if he plays, or Nick Vigil, both on the Vikings. Vigil is his backup. And Vigil had eight tackles, scored 12 points in our in our uh, league. Um, you know, eight, eight solo tackles, two assists. Oh, and he had a sack as well. So he was really good, and Anthony Barr is barely owned, but that could be a productive spot there. And I'm not really going to give any more IDPs because it's hard. It's hard for IDP uh, waiver wire advice because some most leagues only play a hand, handful of guys. Yeah, I know. So there could be so first, many good players out there. Looking for a starting linebacker who could rack up some tackles. Take a look at Anthony Barr, Nick Vigil, whoever's going to start for uh, for the Vikings. And um, real quick, if you have any kickers to add. Uh, yes, um, I have Matt Gay at uh, Indianapolis this week, so indoors and you know coming off a, a decent performance. Matt Prater gets Minnesota, and then Greg Joseph uh, in that same game against Arizona. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we will recap the Sunday, the Monday night game real quick. We'll do the drop meter and we'll give you the rest of the names you need to know on the waiver wire. We'll be right back. We're back here to talk about Las Vegas and Baltimore, 33-27. Okay. Josh Jacobs, he's he's not healthy. Jeez, what do you do here? I mean, do you try to buy low on Kenyon Drake? Because I like, how is Jacobs going to make it? He already has turf toe. He hobbled off the field so many times yesterday. He had to change his cleats, I think, once at least. I don't know. Uh, you know, so that was really concerning. And he's coming off a two touchdown game where he was completely uninvolved in the passing game and averaged three point four yards per carry with one catch. So, you know, give me your read on the Raiders running backs right now. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, Kenyon Drake is probably a guy you want to see if you can buy low on because the casual fantasy player will look at it, especially non-PPR, and say, oh, he didn't do very much. And if they look at the box score and they see Josh Jacobs scoring the touchdowns, and, you know, I saw some people doing some victory laps last night about he's still their best running back, and he might be, Jacobs. I hope he is. But the fact that, you, like you said, he's not 100%, not involved in the passing game. Uh, you got lucky with the game that you got last night because he fell into the end zone twice. He could have probably should have got three touchdowns if they had given him another carry. They gave him the one carry on the on the goal line there at the end um, before the, the false start and then the interception. So he could have had a three touchdown game. But uh, it's tough. It's tough to trust. So yeah, I think he if you can find somebody to take him as a sell high candidate, I would absolutely try and make a trade. All right, Tyson Williams or Latavius Murray, who do you like better going forward? In the first half, Tyson Williams had 20, ca- uh, 20 snaps and Latavius had four. In the second half, Murray and overtime, Murray had 17 and Williams had 15. It really just seemed like they were relying more on Latavius down the stretch. Who do you like more going forward? It's still Tyson, but you know, like you said before, uh, if Latavius Murray is available, uh, I would put him second behind Elijah Mitchell um, to pick up ahead of Naeem Hines. Um, and their roster percentage in terms of Hines and, and Murray right now are really close, 67% and 65%, or 68%, 65%, something like that. Um, he's going to be involved. You know, Murray's certainly going to be involved. And then we just don't know what's going to happen at some point with Le'Veon Bell or Devontae Freeman. But, I mean, you can't not look at Tyson Williams and say he needs more work. You know, yeah. he looked good in the passing game, explosive with the touchdown run. Um, but he, Baltimore's think, not going to do that. He was terrible in pass protection on the – on I think on the fumble, right? I mean – at the very end there, um, he, he got beat. I have to go back and look, but I'm sure you're right. But, but he also had three, how many catches did he have? He had three catches for 29 yards. He looked pretty good in that role, and they were throwing to the running backs. Like this And, was and uh, Lamar missed him on a wide open throw on the right side. What did you just think overall? I mean, it just felt to me like without Dobbins and without Edwards, they just, they're not a power running team right now. And they are, it's just surprising that they played a, a, an overtime and their two leading running backs combined for 19 carries, you know, and, and Jackson threw 30 passes, which is a lot, but not a ton. I don't know, man. It just didn't look natural to me. Like, didn't look like the Ravens. Are you concerned? Uh, I mean, not yet. Uh, I would be concerned as a Ravens fan because now they got to play the Chiefs, even though they're home. And, you know, you could be staring at 0 2. So that's not fun uh, for a team that, you know, a lot of people still think is the best in the division, even with the Browns and the Steelers there. So, you know, you knew that uh, they're going to try and throw the ball more this season um, after drafting Bateman and bringing in Watkins, and, and maybe that was the game plan all along. And, and look, you know, you had the big play to, to Watkins in the second half. You know, Marquise Brown looked good at the start of the game. You know, they got him on some linebackers, and he looked fantastic. But Mark Andrews, you paid him all this money and then was basically a non-factor, uh, you know, for what his role typically is and what his production typically is. He had a bad drop in the second half also. 
So I think we'll see a little bit more of Baltimore moving forward. Uh, Baltimore, you know, traditionally under, under Lamar Jackson, especially this week, because, you know, he's typically a self-motivated guy. And, and, you know, you can see him on the bench after the game saying, that's on me, that's on me. Um, yeah. uh, with the two fumbles late in the game. So I think we'll get a better Lamar Jackson, a better Mark Andrews. Uh, the receivers, I think, are interesting, but not necessarily. I don't think Marquise Brown is a must start yet. And I don't think that Sammy Watkins is a must add yet. Hey, by the way, uh, Lamar, if you fumble again, please don't stay down on the field that long because we all thought you were injured. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, Schrager also telling me that Tyson Williams had two botched handoffs, which I guess I did not know. So and it's some like it. Maybe they're just not trusting him fully yet. He's learning, and Latavius could be more more dependable. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll it, I think the way you should view it, if you just want to, you know, sum it up succinctly, is Williams is more Dobbins, so he'll get a few more touches and has a lot more explosiveness at this point. And Murray is more Edwards. You know, he'll be a little bit more of a reliable guy that they can lean on, but not necessarily an explosive player. I mean, look, he looked that way when he ran the ball. He, the touchdown saved you if you had to start him at all. All right, let's go to the dropo meter. Zero to 10, zero. No way am I dropping this guy. 10, oh yeah, he's already, I already dropped him. Caught him at halftime. JD McKissick, 67% roster, did not have a catch. He ran ran some routes. He played on third down, but no catches in this game. So JD McKissick. Four. Philip Lindsay, 75% rostered. Seven. Elijah Moore, 61%. Four. I saw like Dave... Dave not giving up on Elijah Moore, but not very optimistic. Like I, I, I don't, I don't like when people overreact to week one. I'm not saying he's doing that, but like it's one game. You like this guy a lot. Like give him a chance. I guess so. But he wasn't a high draft pick. I mean, he's only 61% rostered. Right. But like, that's Dave's guy. Like, you know, yeah, I know. Yeah, Dave likes him. Uh, okay. So, but you, you drop him for obviously all the top guys, but would you drop for him William, for my, if you're just going receiver for receiver for Mike Williams? Yes. For Cole Beasley. Yes. For Sterling Shepard. Yes. Uh, probably for Tim Patrick. Okay. That's the extent of it. 85% rostered Matt Ryan at Tampa Bay. Uh, I have him listed as a drop. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody's starting him and he looked bad against the, the Eagles. Ben Roethlisberger against Vegas. Uh, no, I'd hold him. Zach Moss, 77%. Yeah. It's hard to hold him. We need the meet. Remember meter, drop a meter. Um, seven. Six. Michael, Pitt six, six. Michael Pittman. Uh, six. Trey Sermon, zero. zero. Brandon Ayuk, zero. Marquez Callaway, zero. Mike Gesicki, three. Ramondre Stevenson, two. Darnell Mooney, zero. Yeah, he he played. I think he played every snap. Uh, That's a good defense, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Sony Michelle, uh, two. Try to hold on to these guys. Let's go to the waiver wire and talk more about some. I have Ronald Jones as a drop candidate. I'm going to see how many people drop him. The reason why I, I would consider dropping him is I just don't think, I don't think he's going to lose his job, first of all, you know, or his role because he's fumbled before. It might be one game, whatever, but he'll be back. But what what is he, like, when are you going to feel comfortable starting him if Fournette doesn't? That's the him? problem. Yeah. All right, quarterbacks. So Jameis is the top, Derek Carr, Terod Taylor, Teddy Bridgewater. And then let's talk about Heineke because he's probably the only one available in most two quarterback leagues. So he scored 11 fantasy points on 15 pass attempts. He scored 20 something against the Bucks in the playoffs last year. I think it was 26. He does run yeah, 300, one and one, and then a rushing touchdown. So that's 12, 18 minus 16. Yeah. And so. 46 yards on the ground too. Yeah, I think it's 26. So, yeah, um, you think he's going to be a worthy starting quarterback? In those formats, two quarterback super flex leagues, yes, he'll be in the conversation. Like in the Scott Fishbowl, for example, I had Ryan Fitzpatrick, Daniel Jones, and Ryan Tannehill. So not a great first week for me as my top three quarterbacks. Um, so I'm going to make a you know pretty significant bid on, on Heineke because it's a super flex league. In another super flex league, dynasty league that I'm in, um, I'm probably not going to go crazy for Heineke because I have Stafford, Ryan, and Wentz. You know, I'm not starting him over those guys. In our two quarterback league, uh, my guess is Dave is going to be the one who puts the biggest bid on Taylor Heineke because his quarterbacks, I only know this because I tried to trade with them. I'm sure you did as well. Um, Trey Lance is his only 
significant second quarterback, I think maybe with um, you have Brady, right? Yeah. I have Wilson. He has somebody yeah. that's decent. If you need to know who has Brady in any of our leagues, the answer is me. Yeah. So he has he has one decent quarterback and then Trey Lance and and his third quarterback going into the season was Drew Locke. So like I offered him. Did you make a trade offer to him? Oh yeah. Yeah, like three of them. He turned them down? Yeah, I mean they weren't layups, but yeah, the, he turned them down. One was like, yeah, whatever. Yes, I he turned them down. I offered him Teddy Bridgewater and Elijah Moore uh for Trey Lance and Jacoby Myers. He said no. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, he's trying to. We'll see. We'll see how much money he spends on uh, on Heineke. All right. Um, I don't know if there's if you want to talk about Jared Goff at Green Bay, Carson Wentz. Nobody wants to start him against the Rams. So Sam... they're all like just just in deeper leagues. If you're stuck, just to take an eye on, keep an eye on. Them. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the running backs. And James White is seventy four percent rostered. Would you rather have White or Hines? I think Hines, but it's close. They're the same guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Would you, yeah. Elijah Mitchell, would you drop James, James White and PPR for Mitchell? Yeah. It's just like you asked me, I, I think about um, who was the one you, did you say Hines? Oh, Gio. I said Geo, but oh, Gio. Yeah, same Gio thing. Better game than Geo. Yeah. I think you have to. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, but that's tough because White is going to give you that floor. You know, five, probably four, four catches minimum. Right. But you want ceiling plays. You don't want four floor plays. I don't know if I want. Well, yeah, you do. But I, but when well, the, let me ask you this, would you rather have 17 more weeks, 16, you know, fantasy weeks of James White getting you 10 to 15 sometimes, maybe the occasional bigger game than that. Or six weeks of Elijah Mitchell being the lead guy for the 49ers? Like, what would you sign up for? I just don't know what the lead guy is. That's the problem. But I I guess... Or, okay, would you sign up for 15 to 18 total touches of the 49ers yeah. running back? More. It might also depend on, is James White my number two? Or is he my number three? You know, if I... if I This is a flex spot, then I'm probably going to go with the, the upside. But no, no. If this is a number two running back spot, I'm going to go with the upside. If it's a flex spot and I already have two running backs with big upside, then I might just take... The floor play is obvious. You know what? Who cares? Nobody's dropping James White for Elijah Mitchell. You have somebody worse. Silly question. Sorry. Um, okay. Tony Jones. We talked about he had 11 carries and a catch. Kenneth Gainwell or Kenny Gainwell as he goes by. As Chris pointed out, he had a touchdown called back. So he could have had a two touchdown day. Did have fewer catches than Miles Sanders, which was interesting. But, you know, how do you view Gainwell? Do you view him basically like James White and Naeem Hines? No, I view him more like Tony Jones, you know, so you're going to get some flex appeal from him, but this is more of a, okay, maybe a flex, but more a lottery ticket type of guy because Boston Scott played on special teams. So it's pretty clear that Gainwell is the number two guy. Now he may be in a, you know, the James White type role, you know, the, just the pass catching role. And if something happened to, to Miles Sanders, then they, you know, use Scott more as a runner. But I think Gainwell, you know, showed you that he's going to get, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, eight to 10 touches weekly and can do some potentially special things with that if that's the case. Yeah, and we know Miles Sanders has trouble staying healthy too. Would you drop uh would you drop Zach Moss for Mark Ingram? If I need somebody for this week, yes, probably still yes anyway. I mean, if Moss is going to play, you know, Sean McDermott saying it was a numbers thing, well, is that going to change on a week to week basis? You know, probably not. So this is one of the more disappointing things because I, I like Zach Moss. I thought he was going to have a chance to, you know, be the lead runner for Buffalo this year. Not that he was going to be a, a starting fantasy option, but potential flex play. Uh, but for those people that invested in Devin Singletary, and I have him in a couple leagues, you know, this is a that was a win on Sunday. And and if this is going to continue to be the case, then he's the uh, he's the runaway winner of that backfield by far. You also have Damian Williams, Carlos Hyde, and Cordero Patterson listed here. He's All more backup deep league options. Yeah. So what about Larry Roundtree? I just don't know what the case is going to be moving forward, you know, and, and I think we ended up chasing, you know, those three guys in terms of Roundtree, Kelly, and, uh, and Justin Jackson. So, I mean, you could certainly put in a claim for him, but I, I, it's Eckler a bust for me. And do you think, last question about running backs, do you think that Trey Sermon is going to have more value or more of a role right now than Jamichael Hasty, who obviously was ahead of him? I don't know. I don't know. I, I the way I explain it in the, in the story is, if you want to put a, a small bid on Hasty, feel free because 
he may be the the second guy. And and if something happens to Mitchell now, you, know, you can do that. But I, I would also say the same thing about Jeff Wilson. You know, if you have an IR spot, I I put a small bit on him too. Let's go to our wide receivers here. And obviously, we we spoke a lot about Mike Williams, um, Marquise Brown, and Jacoby Myers are our ten team league options, perhaps. And both got off to good starts. Who do you who do you like better, Brown or Myers? Different formats: Myers PPR, Brown non PPR. Half, I'd probably go Brown. Mike Williams is sixty-three uh, percent rostered. Go get him. Sterling Shepard twenty-eight percent rostered. Go get him. Cole Beasley sixty percent rostered. So Jamie likes Shepard better than Beasley. Uh, Tim Patrick. Do you think he's he's a twelve-team league kind of guy or, or deep? Yeah. I think so. I mean, you know, you're looking at what he did last year without Sutton there with Judy. The quarterback plays better. The only thing I, I'll caution is that, you know, Hamler is going to have a little bit bigger role than he had last year. You know, he was banged up and, and didn't do very much. So Heath actually said on, on HQ, which I was surprised that he would take Hamler over Patrick. Um, I, I think just Patrick, you know, showed you enough last year that the coaching staff trusts him and he can do, you know, a, a, a little as a little bit more of a route tree at this point. So we'll see how things go for him. I don't think he's going to be as good as he was last season because, you know, Sutton's still there and Judy was a rookie learning his way. But uh, he should absolutely be rostered for sure. And some other names to know. Jalen Rager, Nelson Aguilar, Christian Kirk, Zach Paschal, Sammy Watkins. Look, let's give Watkins credit, man. He was good. Eight targets that he turned into four catches for 96 yards. And he's got a little revenge game coming up. Look at this. Let's schedule here. Kansas City. Well, I don't know if it's a good schedule for Watkins in particular uh, and at Detroit then after that. So you just never know with this team. And at some point, Bateman, Bateman's back. So what happens then? Gabriel Davis, which pick a Raiders wide receiver. I put Hunter Renfro as the lead guy, you know, and this was kind of something I was working through last night as the as the game was unfolding because Edwards in the fourth quarter and overtime was fantastic. Uh, Ruggs had the two big catches, but he, he's never had more than five targets in a game, uh, which is hard to fathom given the draft capital that they invested in him. So I would actually put him third. So I think all three are, are, are in, should be in consideration. But, you know, Renfro, we saw at the end of his rookie season, uh, not so much last year, but it's very clear Derek Carr likes him. Edwards showed his potential. He had four catches for 81 yards. All of them came on the last drive of regulation and then overtime. He had nothing before that. But, you know, this is – I'm going to have a tough decision. Am I going to watch the Mannings or the regular Monday Night Football broadcast? If I were not a fantasy analyst, I would watch the Mannings. That was really cool. But the Monday night football analysts are the ones who are in the meetings with the coaches, and they can give you some good insight. And they kept talking about Brian Edwards. It almost it almost felt like they were holding back because the coaches apparently are very high on Edwards. And, the, you know, it was greasy. I think he said, like, the coaches think he could be even better than Henry Ruggs. So, you know, only five targets. He caught four of them for 81 yards. He nearly had the game-winning touchdown. Um, Jamie also put Deontay Harris on here. He had a big touchdown catch. But I don't think people are making a lot of plays for for these guys. No. Yeah. And uh, what about KJ Osborne? Any interest there? He had nine targets for for Minnesota. No. What about Devontae Parker? Fifty two percent rostered. Yeah, I put him on the list. I put him ahead of the Raiders guys. I just don't know what to expect with Will Fuller back and you know Gasecki doing nothing. So we'll see. As we go to tight end here. Now, Juwan Johnson, Adam Troutman, Cole Komet, Gerald Everett, those are the guys we talked about. But what if Jonu Smith and or Jared Cook are available? Jonu at the Jets, Jared Cook against Dallas. Those would be the top two guys. I'd still take Jonu over Cook. Um, only five targets, but uh, you know, caught all five of them, 42 yards, and also had a carry. So you know they're going to try and still continue to be creative with him. And Cook, man, that was uh, interesting. Eight targets. You know, Justin Herbert threw a lot, but he was the third guy behind Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. So he's going to be a factor. How was Dallas against tight ends in week one? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty terrible. All right. And yeah, we had a nice discussion about these tight ends. So Juwan Johnson, uh, Komet was two. Everett was three with the injuries to two receivers. Not big ones, but two receivers. I, I mean, I'm a little discouraged by Everett because he had basically the same amount of snaps as Disley. One fewer target. Yes, he did catch a touchdown. I don't know how reliable he's going to be. Right. And then you've got Farrell Brown for Houston. He had five targets. He had 67 yards against Jacksonville. You have James O'Shaughnessy for Jacksonville, who played 80% of the snaps and had eight targets. Actually, I think Dalton Schultz we should talk about here with Gallup out. Maybe he benefits. He had six targets at Tampa Bay. I mean, Prescott threw almost 60. What did he throw? 50? 50, 50 plus. Yeah. Um, the thing that 
why Schultz isn't higher is because Blake Jarwin's obviously still healthy. Now they they played similar amount of snaps. It was sixty nine percent for Schultz, fifty eight percent for Jarwin. Six targets for Schultz, four for Jarwin. So I gave Jarwin the, the excuse me Schultz the slight edge, but it's I think they're just going to cannibalize each other each week. And then the DSTs, the Browns, the Packers, and the Giants. Browns, 47% roster. They have Houston and Chicago in their next two games. The Packers get Detroit and then at San Francisco. And I think what I read about the Packers' defense, wow, their defensive coordinator has such a terrible track record. He's been a defensive coordinator for four previous seasons. And using the metric expected points allowed, his defense is ranked 30th or worse in three of those four seasons, and they were dreadful in week one. But they do get Detroit, and it's on Monday Night Football at home. It should be, I mean, it should be a bloodbath. And then the Giants on Thursday. I would think so. Washington. Yeah. Uh, all right. Matt Gay, Matt Prater, Greg Joseph, those are your kickers. And Jamie, that was our first waiver wire show. All right. In the books. Yay. Yay. There's Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. More of your waiver wire questions. Bring it on. Also, Jamie made all of his leagues a Wednesday night waiver league, so you can tell us how you feel about that. Chris, Not all of them, just our analyst ones. Okay, well, Chris hates it. Unless, and this is the case, I think, in all of Jamie's leagues. You got to have regular free agency after waivers run. What Chris doesn't like, which is a good point, you put in a fab bid, you put in a waiver claim, you don't get anybody, it's Thursday, the games are starting, and you still don't have you know, a quarterback or a DST, and you can't get anyone. Because you have to wait for Fab to run again. Well, that's why you should put in multiple bids. Yeah, you could do that too. Lazy Chris. All right, out of here. Doesn't do that. We'll talk to you. I'm sure he does. We'll talk to you on uh, Wednesday with some buy or sell, with some buy lows and sell highs with the fantasy cops. Wednesday shows are great. We'll talk to you then. For Jamie, I'm Adam and Ben. See you.